It was an amazing trip, of course. It is a country that has been going through crisis for a bit now. But hey, you know, people just, they leave. You don't wait until everything is settled before you leave. You gotta leave regardless what is there. Amen? And uh, we had the Bible Institute there for a few years, and because of the crisis, we had to put an end to it. Uh, as I was mentioning on the video, we even lost some of our students during that crisis and the war. Not war, but yeah, crisis. People were being killed, many. And some of them got killed too. Some of them also ran to the neighbor country, that's Rwanda. And uh, we thought things were stabilizing better, so things are starting again to move forward. And we thank God for that. I bring you the greetings of Pastor Mark and Betty. I don't know if you remember them. And as well, Pastor Edmund. I bring you greetings as well from them. Amen. Amen. I had the opportunity to speak at a conference called Friendship Rescue, Discovering the Power and the Blessing of Female Friendship. It's one of my books coming soon. And I've been doing seminars with the women here in this house. And uh, I'm telling you, I was blown away by the impact this book has on the women in that land. We had an amazing turnout. Thousands of ladies come forth to participate in one, two, three, four days conference starting on Wednesday to Saturday. And it was very profitable. And I'm just believing God very soon probably we can have a friendship rescue. I know Pastor Janie were working on something like that. You know, God created women to function as a company, as a group. The best thought of God about women is to use you as a team, not an individual. According to Psalm 68, yeah, the Lord gave the commandments, the command, and a company of women carried the command declaring the good tidings or the good news or the gospel. God created women to be relational. Everything about a woman is relational, physically, emotionally, psychologically, everything is um, relational. But for whatever reason, I don't know, I try to draw some cases in the books, but of course, I don't have the fullness of it. It is just difficult for women generally to work together, generally speaking. And, and somebody told me, is that not a myth? No, it's not a myth. I mean, <laughs> in the Bible, there's Jonathan and David, amen? Jonathan and? David. These guys were friends. They loved one another in a covenant way. They were not married. They were not going out, all right? Just to make that clear. That's amazing friendship. I look through the Bible. I, haven't, I have not seen in the Bible a relationship as a David Jonathan type between two ladies. Somebody said, What about Naomi and Ruth? Those are not girlfriends. That's mom and daughter. All right? So, in the seminar, what I do, I just clear up the air by making women understand there is a blessing in female friendship. That's why it's called discovering the power and the blessing of female friendship. It's friendship rescue. Why are we rescuing friendship between women? Because friendship between women are just on the floor. So I believe in these last days, God want to use women like lionesses Amen. together Amen. as a company. There's only one lady clapping in the back. She really believes in it. You guys need to come to the conference. <laughs> I will say it again. I really believe in these last days, God want to operate through company of women, not just individuals. All right? That's, I believe, what God want to do in the earth. And so we talk about those things. I talk about the different dimension of friendship. Just put it simple. Lack of communication between women or assuming usually is the greatest danger. Can you imagine you have two girlfriends and one assume for her, you are a dimension three. 
of relationship. A dimension three of relationship, we call one another weekly, we text one another. If on my birthday I invite you, if it's your birthday you invite me, you know my kid's birthday, you know we're tight. We're not number four yet, but we are three. That is number three. But there is also number one. Number one, we meet at church, we hug. Hey, sister, praise the Lord, hallelujah, great. How was your day? Good. And then we go home. All right? It's not because you're from the same church, you should be friends. Uh-oh. You are sisters in the Lord, but you, it's not because you're from, from the same church, we need to be friends. All right? So you see how many people come to church and leave the church because there's no love? Because I didn't find a friend? You didn't come to look for a friend in church. Jesus is already your friend. Am I speaking to somebody? No, no, let's be real. That's not the message of the day, but I just want to warm you up a little bit. Huh? So you are a number one category. Number one, we meet at church. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Sister, God bless you. Now, imagine you think she's number three, but for her, you are number one. Now, talk to me now. So she always call you. She open up to you. She tell you her tears and her cries and her worries and, and her problem. What's happening at home and with the kids. She calls you on Wednesday and on Thursday. And then she texts you and she invites you to her birthday. And you go like that. My God, she's too much, this woman. Too much. She's too possessive. Have you ever heard that word? She's too possessive. Oh, my God. I don't want to hear all the garbage in her family. She always open up and tell me all this. Oh, my goodness. And then you, you feel like she's so snub. I'm telling her everything. She, she's always with the other people. I don't even understand. I call her. She never called me. She invited people at her birthday. She never invited me at her birthday. It's because you're level one for her. That's the only reason. So you see, you start getting offended. Why? Because one shoot here, one shoot here. You miss one another. So women, you need help. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> because if you don't understand this thing, relationship will kill you. Or you will put your hope somewhere and then they don't respond accordingly. And then you get offended, and you get angry, and you begin to be judgmental. Simply because she's acting towards you at the dimension she put you in. And you are acting toward her at the dimension you put her in. But you're missing one another. So we got to talk about it. All right? Is that okay? So it's not because you are in the same church you should be buddy buddies. <laughs> you know, we need to be close. God wants us to be close. If we really love one another and we're in the same church, oh my God, we're one family. We need to be so tight. Why? I'm trying to open to her. She's running away from me. I don't even know who she thinks she is. Next time I used to sit by her, now I'm going to sit the other side now. I don't want to get, get close to her. And she's ignoring me. She's so happy when we, she's with the other girls. But when she gets close to me, she doesn't say anything. Yeah. Oh, my God, there's some clicks in this church. Too many clicks here. Yeah. Yeah. In heaven, there are clicks. There are the archangels and there are the angels. <laughs> Anyhow. Jeff, it's so good to see you. Wow. Please stand up. Can we put our hand together? This is a long time member of Cross Point. Long, long time. Wow. Praise the Lord. God bless you. Jeff was with us for the longest time and he moved to Nova Scotia and he just moved back. Many of you don't know him, but few of you know him. He is a good man. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Anyway, after Bujumbura, of course, I went to Rwanda to visit Apostle Masasu, we had a couple conference. Couple. Married couple conference. That one was a very serious one. 
and it finished so beautifully where the husband have flowers for their wives and stuff like that. And they took a walk together hand in hand on the mountain. It was beautiful. And I just want to bring that forth to you. Husbands, wives. Husband? Husbands? Are you tired? What did she do to you this morning? <laughs> Husband. Yes. Wives. Yes. Wives. Yes. How come it's only Sister Dio and uh, Minister <laughs> Juliet? What did it do to you? <laughs> Wives. Yes. Is it a year? Laughing or a year crying? <laughs> Wives! Yes. You know, I love this marriage thing. Yes. I just enjoy it. Because it's the reflection of the relationship between Christ and the church. That's why it seems sometimes so complicated. You know why? Because if you're not spiritual, you will not succeed in it. I'm talking about both. A husband and the wife, spiritual. When I say spiritual, I'm not speaking about speaking in tongues. I'm talking about who fear the Lord. Can be one side. Covenant does not stand on one side. And that's why I always like to encourage people. Fear the Lord in your relationships. That lady, I guarantee you, it's a matter of time she will freak you out at one time. This guy, it's a matter of time. He will disappoint you. It will happen. It doesn't matter. So if you're relying just on their well-behaving, you are setting up yourself from disappointment and deception. So put in the back of your mind, this is a human being made of flesh. And he will miss the mark, even often. But I choose to trust God. Here is the key of marriage. Never go this way. Go this way. Look in the mirror. If we are too busy looking at what the other guy or the other person need to fix, we will miss the point. Because you are not responsible for the life of a person. But you are responsible of your life. Yeah, but you don't understand. Of course, you're right, I don't understand. But probably I understand. The consequences are too heavy. When I talk about heavy, they are for not just a lifetime, but they are for generations' lifetime. It doesn't affect only your lifetime. It will affect generations' lifetime. Therefore, single ladies and single men, don't rush into it. Take thy time. It's better to take your time than cooking it. You cook it. You make it happen. You wrap it up. You put it together. You manipulate it. You touch it. You move it. I'm telling you, it in our prayers. When you're dating and you find yourself fighting so often, what's going to happen when you get married? <laughs> Were you supposed to hide all the ugliness and be a gentleman or, you know, it is World War II. What's going to happen when now you, you have her or, you know what I'm saying? Watch, watch out. Be at peace. If you have to always find peace and refine peace and convince you of peace, 
Every time, so often, all the time, hold it. You're not married yet. No rush. Hold it. But I will go if somebody else really go. Because if you have to go with somebody else because I'm holding it, when we get married, there's no guarantee you will stay by me. Paul said, it's actually better to remain single than to get married. Jada, drop your hand. <laughs> Do you understand? It doesn't mean when we are married, we are suffering so bad, we regret. No, 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 no. It simply means when you are single, you are free. You are more free. Every married person can agree with me. <laughs> you are more free. You can, you can sit down in the church right now and say, Oof, the Lord just spoke to me. At the end of the service, I'm buying a ticket. I'm going right now to Nicaragua. And you don't need to ask permission to anybody and check and see what is going on. No, 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 no. You just, bonk, 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 freedom, 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 freedom. When you get married, when the Lord says, <laughs> it's not enough. <laughs> Beside the Lord says, your spouse also needs to say. <laughs> and until your spouse says, it's like whatever God says doesn't matter. I'm telling you the truth. Okay. Are you catching me? Henry, this is not an excuse to remain single. <laughs> so we had a time talking to couples. It was very emotional. Really. We all cry so much. Because family were suffering. Suffering. Women suffering. Men suffering. It's painful. And those who have been there understand it more than I who can speak about that. But even though I have never been there, I feel the pain so much. How much more really it is in reality. It is very painful. I like what Pastor Joe said one day. It's better to renovate your old house. <laughs> At least you know the dimensions. <laughs> than trying to go buy a new land to build. Yes. All right? So if you are married right now, stick into it. Work it out. Find a way. Don't drop out. This is not for people who are dating, all right? This is not for boyfriend, girlfriend dating. I'm talking about marriage covenant. If you are married before God, before man, stay in it. Fight for it. Pray it. Cry it. Do whatever you need to do. Stick into it. There's no human being who feel like, oh, it's so beautiful, our wedding, marriage, we've been together for 20 years and everything is rosy, everything is beautiful. Oh, wow, wonderful. And the guy went on for 10 minutes. Finally, I feel like, are you married to Lucifer without knowing? <laughs> the angel of light. You have two different human beings Entering a covenant. Brothers and sisters, guess what? We might be silent and quiet, but doesn't mean everything is always rosy. Yes. Huh? There are some moments of arm wrestling. In Rwanda, I talk about silent treatment. And I gave them an example of a man that I know who silent treated his wife to a point the woman lost her brain. It's a very dangerous weapon. It belittles you. It makes you feel like, and it's a game. You come in, hello, how are you? Like if there's nothing. For months and years, she became like cuckoo. May the Lord help us. I say, may the Lord help us. Thank you, Jesus. I watched the preaching of Pastor GB last week. Is there any other son? This one. I hope you catch something out of that. Did you? Yeah. It was very powerful. I feel like, what did he eat in Africa? <laughs> Can we put our hand together for Pastor Jenny and Pastor John Baptist? Just wonderful servant of God. And of course, Pastor Jenny is back from a long trip of three months. 
I told her no more long like that, unless if you bring back millions of dollars, <laughs> then we can let you go for longer. Thank you, Jesus. Let's go to the Word of God for the next 35 minutes. Weary yet pursuing. Weary yet pursuing. Somebody say weary, weary. yet yes. pursuing. Say it again. Yes. Okay, everybody say it. Thank you. Judges chapter 8, verse 4. We're going to read it together. I will draw a few lines, and we're going to have a time of prayer. I am so glad to see you all. Then Gideon and the 300 men who were with him came to where? And cross over. Okay, everybody, we're going to read it together. Are you ready? One, two, three, go. Okay, let's say it again. Then Gideon and the 300 men who were with him came to the Jordan and crossed over, weary yet pursuing. You know, when I was in Burundi, I was doing some recording. God worked in very fancy, amazing ways. You know, he has no respect really of a person. And in the midst of one task, God can come and begin to speak to you about something that has nothing to do with the task you're doing. You catch me? You know, you are standing in one spot, and then you're doing it, right? I'm doing a recording. I'm doing a recording on the Dream Master. That is a part of our school of prophets. And as I'm doing the recording, imagine the camera is standing in front of me, and I'm doing the recording. And that portion was in French. So I'm looking at my note in English, and I'm translating it in French spontaneously as I'm teaching, and the camera is standing in front. That's already two tasks, all right? Looking in English, translating in French, camera is standing in front of you, and you're intense, you're speaking about it. In the midst of that, I am keep talking, so my brain is working. You agree with me? And suddenly, I saw this church. Cross point. Now, I didn't stop speaking. God is just amazing. Sometimes uh, my brain just cannot sustain sometimes the manifestation of his wisdom. Now, I see this church, and I saw individual, they will begin to run like that. And they were running, and they get in front of this river, and no one was wondering what to do. It's like everybody knew at this time, here's what we need to do. And what needed to be done was not to sit by the river, and everybody begin to try to cross over. All right? Now, I'm recording the dream master. I'm talking about that dreams is the spiritual monitor for you and I to know what God is doing in this earth so we can have the upper hand. In other words, we don't want to face the same thing like the pagan and trying to sort out things at the same moment as the pagan. So now God give us dreams so we know things before they happen. And I'm talking about that. And suddenly I saw the people of this house standing in front of a river and all of them begin to cross. And they were crossing, but they were not crossing walking in the water. They were crossing running in the water. And then I came back to myself and I am keep recording. Did, this, did you get that? This is freaking amazing. <laughs> because you see, my brain, my brain is working. I am focused on the camera. I am speaking. I didn't stop speaking. I am still teaching on the dream master. But at the same time, my spirit has a vision, clear, open, that has nothing to do with the camera, that has nothing to do with what I was teaching in French, even though I was reading in English. But I'm going to see something very separate of a people who are running in the water, crossing on the other side. And some were getting tired, and the strong one will give them the hand to carry them running in the water. And then I come back to myself, I continue my recording. The people recording have no clue of what I was seeing. People, God is the God of the supernatural. And I don't want you for a minute that you think God is a professor of the university who just use logic and knowledge from Google. God is a supernatural God. And he is supernatural in the days of Elijah and he's supernatural today. 
I want to provoke you to get out of the natural, out of the flesh, and enter the realm of faith, the realm of the supernatural. God want to visit his people, my friend. Here is something I'll tell you. You know, Christians really destroy me. I will explain what I mean, okay? Don't take that out of context. I'm going to explain. When I gave my life to the Lord, my first experience with God was supernatural. The God who met me the first time was not an intellectual God. He didn't have to convince me with explanation. I met Jesus Christ in a supernatural way. As I sat down in this church and I saw the Lord flashing light and he walked through this pastor and walked toward me as I received him and he walked in my stomach and he sat down. I walked out of that place like I was walking on air. And I never read the Bible. I didn't know who's John. I didn't know who's Paul. I didn't know what is the gospel. But I was beginning to experience the new birth, experience the spirituality, experience walking with the Lord without knowing anything in the Word. I went home. I had my first prayer. Lord, I want to be your friend. The next day, the pastor preached and ought to be the friend of Jesus. I went back home. I laid down. The roof disappeared. And I saw the light come up on me and God begin to speak to me about things that was about to happen and will come to happen. And many of those things have already occurred. So it was God speaking to me. It was not the devil. I will be speaking with Jesus where I will lay down on my bed praying and Jesus will begin to tickle me because I'm very ticklish. If you move your hand like that toward me, I'm done. And and so my kids torment me all the time with that. And Jesus began to tickle me and I laughed. You know why I was laughing? Because my parents have found out what the heck was going on. I was feeling so oppressed. I was feeling so fearful. Dad was trying to toggle me down. Oppression was coming. And the Holy Ghost stuck, tickled me. And I laughed on my own. My roommates, who were not Christian, were in the other room. And they would hear me laugh. <laughs> on the floor, rolling around. And they would come at the door. <laughs> and I'm laughing. After that laughter, oppression is uplifted, depression is uplifted, fear is uplifted, doubt is uplifted. Are you hearing me? And then I will walk out of there and I will meet the Christian at the church. I said, what did Jesus do with you yesterday? <laughs> I didn't know. I, I'm just being real. What did Jesus do? He said, what do you mean? I said, Jesus did not visit you. He said, no, Jesus doesn't walk in people's bedroom. I said, oh, me. Yesterday at this time, we were having hide and seek. Sick and hide. hide. <laughs> Uh, you know, tickling one another. And they will look at me like that. They, say, they will say, it. you know what? You need to get in the word. The word. <laughs> you need to get in the word. <laughs> and I feel like, no, 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 this guy. And I will go to the other person. Last Thursday, what did Jesus, did Jesus, I thought Jesus was visiting every Christian in the bedroom and they will do things together. You know what I'm saying by? That was my Christian life until Christian told me, just go in the word. Jesus doesn't do that anymore. Just go in the word. Jesus doesn't do that. Old. And, and some will say, when you mature, you are still young. It's because you are not mature yet in faith. That's why Jesus does that to you. But when you mature, the word, the word becomes the foundation. And the word. You know, I know, the, I know that is true and I love the word. Amen? But I'm going to tell you, the word on its own, your Christianity is painful. It is true. The professor of the university knows the word. But that word, it is a logos. It's not rhema. It has not become a living word. God is a God of the supernatural. That's what I'm trying to make you understand. That's it. I begin to feel like, yeah, something is wrong with me. I need the word. I don't want, until Jesus visits me, I don't want any more. I feel the presence of God so strong, I don't want any more. In those days, brother and sister, I will have angels come and carry me in my sleep, and we will run. I have prophets of the old, including Jeremiah, sitting down and begin to teach me things that I didn't do. I never read a word. Probably is the first time I'm sharing that with you. That's why you're looking at me like that. I never shared that with you. I was spiritual to the high end. I knew nothing about the word, but I thank God he humbled me and brought me back to the word. Amen. Do you understand? Yeah. But that doesn't mean we throw everything out. You can throw the baby with the bath water. It frustrates me to see Krishna become just a bunch of well-educated Bible scholars. But they don't even believe in the supernatural. 
they don't believe Jesus can talk to you audibly. When you tell that to somebody, say, mm, wako, weird, wako, weird. We need to discern the spirit that's speaking to you. Because nowadays God speaks in his word, the word. You know what, leave it alone. God speaks audibly. If you never experience it, at least know about it. It's okay. That's not what we are chasing for. But you know what? It's a tragedy and a deception that you don't believe that God does those things or you think it's just wacko when God would like you to experience such. I mean, the voice of God is irresistible. When you hear the voice of God, you doubt no more. The reason we doubt is because we never heard the voice of God. The first time I heard the audible voice of God, it was regarding Pastor Sebit. Very clearly. And God began to speak to me, and I was standing like that after church service, talking, sitting in my couch, and suddenly it, my eyes had to close by themselves. And I'm not tired. I'm trying to open my eyes, they can't open, and I'm not sleeping. I'm awake, but my eyes close. And suddenly I hear the voice that's begin to speak to me. Very audibly. This year, this naturally ears, I was not in a dream. God speak. That's why when worship goes on, don't get lost somewhere there worrying about yourself. Enter. I say enter. He's a God of the supernatural. The reason we struggle sometimes in our prayers is because we pray from the wrong position. I will explain. There is the natural, that is the flesh realm, and there is the supernatural, that is the spirit realm. So you have the flesh realm and you have the spirit realm. A lot of our prayers are made in the flesh. Let's be real. Here. Yeah. And you wonder why it is so difficult to break through. That's why worship is the bridge. Amen. Worship transports you from this place, that is the natural and the fleshly realm, to the spiritual. Amen. A person who cannot worship, who has not learned the art of worship, that person will sweat in his Christianity. Amen. What do you mean art? The worship there stands for skills. Amen. Worship is the skills to give worth to God. Amen. The same way as leadership, ship, skills to lead. So, you need to learn to worship. Amen. You just don't become a great worshiper just because you are born again. There is an art, there is a skills, there is a knowing, there is a skill that allows you to abandon yourself and forget about yourself. And forget about anybody around you. And you lock in with all your might, all your mind, all your power, all your emotion, all your intellect, all your everything. You are totally not just walking on water. You've been covered by water. You're wet. It's a baptism where you are fully covered in the presence of God. He has your attention. Your hair can testify. Your ears can testify. Your body is all grafted in it. But people come in the church, they feel like God didn't touch me. How oh, will God touch you when you are so distracted? Because you need to cross. Somebody say cross. cross. And to cross, God give you a bridge. And that bridge, it is worship in this case. That's why what Pastor Coffee was saying is so powerful. The message you hear in preaching, it doesn't have a great effect on a man, man who did not come in the worship place. Because you see, you walk in there, you hear me preach, you are in the natural. And the word we speak, that spirit and life. And the natural man cannot comprehend it. So you get a cross on this side. That's why we do prayer. That's why we do fasting. That's why we do worship. That's why we do overnight. Because you don't 
move from here to there by luck or by chance. You have to take a decision. The same way you took one to leave home today to come to this address. You didn't show up here just because you were willing. You put action to it. You know, I travel and God bless. Everywhere I go, they have amazing worship. But I'm telling you, when I come to this house of ours, and I'm hearing this worship going, I feel like God wet me some more. I want to go under the cascade of the Niagara Falls in the Holy Ghost. You know what I'm saying? Your socks, everything is wet. You walk in your shoes wet of the presence of God. You have to be intense. You got you to get in. But the devil is working full time. Your problems. You know one of the greatest lies the devil have given to people in the church? God understand. God knows. God understand. You know, whenever you hear somebody say that, he just gave himself, that's the fortress, is a stronghold of a lie to give himself an excuse to remain where they are. I have come by the word of the Lord today to tell you it's time to cross over. I say it's time to cross over. Because that vision showed me that God wants to take us to cross over somewhere. And we don't care if it's in the water, we don't care if it's in the fire, we will cross over not walking, we'll cross over running on the other side. Somebody's crossing over this morning. I say you're crossing over this morning. Somebody's crossing over. We are crossing over on the other side. We've been on this side for too long. We have to cross on the other side. We've done the same thing on this side all the time. We have to cross on the other side so we can see new things, so we can touch new things, that we can walk in new ground, that we can experience God to a greater measure of his presence and his glory. It is time to cross on the other side. I am so hungry for the Holy Ghost. I feel like I can stay in church and not move and put that deep worship on and have a time with my God and let the problem scream until they get tired of screaming and let the opposition fight until they are tired of fighting because I'm so concentrated to my God and with my God in my God around my God that I care about anything else around. That's why David said, though I walk, through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you are with me. When you become focused on God, people can scream, you don't hear their screams. But if you're not focused on God, every little scream make you panic. Every noise of the devil, you feel like, oh my God, I'm finished now. No, 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 no. It is the pain where you are. The place where you are will decide of your perception. This church is a spiritual church. But I want we go somewhere else. I feel, I feel, I feel we need to escalate somewhere. I don't know if you are feeling it. But I just feel it. We need to escalate somewhere. And we don't want to do it few people. We want to do this together. Problem come, problem go. God remain. God remain. God remain. He just lost his brother, Kennedy, from a gunshot. Gun. Not dying of a sickness or, or dying because, you know, you understand what I'm saying? Being shot. And we're not in war. This can make somebody feel like, uh-uh, God, I'm done. She just lost her mother. She just lost her father. They lost their father too. Do you understand people of God? If we do not get close to God, hi, 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 hi. we are, it's going to be tough. Sometimes I wonder how the unbeliever manage this life. If even as Christians, 
we need to wrestle against principalities. Are the pagan, the unbelievers? Where, where do they go to cry? But I want to encourage you. Weary, yet pursue. Exhausted, yet pursue. It's not the time to stop. It's not time to give up. It's not time to make room for the devil in your life. It's not time to doubt, to question. It is not time to wonder. They were weary, yet pursuing. Paul said, persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. No matter where the devil punch, no matter where life has wrestled you to, there is a word for you today. Exhausted, hurt, wounded, pressed down, struck down, but yet, 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 I'm pursuing. I'm pursuing. God has caught you to catch. God saved you so you can fulfill something on this earth. You were caught to catch. Regardless of the odds, let that be your inspiration. The devil does not attack anything that has no worth in the kingdom. And his greatest tool is destruction. And that's why I stand today against every destruction that have come to your mind or to your life. I nullify it in the name of Jesus. Amen. You can cut my leg, I'm going to still keep pursuing with one leg. In the vision, I get now to the third video of the day. Now these people are wondering why I'm so on fire in the videos recording. They don't understand. When you have a vision from God, it fuels you. <laughs> it fuel you. Now, I say to myself, probably this time, God will speak to me again in the third video when I'm recording. It's become interesting to be recording. <laughs> Did you understand? You know what was amazing to me? How can you be focused, recording something, speaking, and you don't stop speaking, and you're still fully intellectually aware of what you're doing, but yet, you're aware also of something else. This is supernatural. So you see what happened? On the third video now. Interesting. This time, I didn't start recording. I just sat down as they are placing the light. We're changing a little bit background. And then I get this following vision. Following with this. Now the guy, now they are talking to me. And by this time, I can hear them. It's called a trance. That also you need to learn it. It's in the Bible Institute. It's in the prophet training. It's called a trance. When a trance happens to a person, you are not aware of your environment. You see sometimes women or men, they get under the power of God and they fall in trance. And people think it's a deliverance, though it could be. But a lot of time, trances look like that. You're like this person is dead and is sitting in the chair. He's looking at you but he doesn't see you. You can even come and touch him, but he's not there. It's a trance. He's not aware of his surrounding. He's being caught up somewhere else. And these people, guess what? They put the lights on, and for five minutes, they are talking to me, and I'm not moving. Five minutes! You know what they thought? Probably he's praying silently so that he can shoot the video properly. I was not praying silently. I was seeing the following of the vision. And I see the people running. It was amazing. Like troops. 
And suddenly, I saw them move things in their hands, on their back, and on their heads. And everything that they were carrying with themselves has their name written on it. That's where I captured some of you by the name that I saw. I said, okay, let's see if this is biblical. It's important we always use the word standard. So this message here is not a preaching. I'm just trying to convey to you a message. Let's read in uh, 1 Samuel 30, 20. There is a spoil and a reward that bear your name. And we're going to go grab that today in the spirit. That's the last verse. I just jumped through all the others. 1 Samuel 30, 20. Thank you, Jesus. They gave him a piece. No, no, not 12. I said 20. 30, 20. Thank you. So David had what? All the sheep and the which the people drove ahead of the other livestock. Now, you see, I've seen you capturing something. For him, it was sheep and cattle. But you, it was something in your hand, something on your head. It took me back, back home in our villages. When you have too many things to carry, <laughs> the head is not the only thing where you put on. You tie it up here, you tie it up here on the side and everywhere. Because there is too much to carry. And David has to capture the ship. To, you're going to capture something today. I say you're going to capture something today. And the cattle, which the people drove ahead of the livestock, and they said, what did they say? No, no, say it loud. Now, I want you to put your name. Say it again. Say it again. There is a spoil that bear your name. Amen. And we are going today in the spirit to capture it. Amen. Now, let me tell you, when I say those things, I talk to you about the spirit and I talk to you about the natural. What we're going to do today, we're going to come here. We're going to capture this here so that it will manifest there. Or oh, simple as that. I came back to myself. I was so excited. I pray without stopping. And I declared and I prophesied and I pulled out things. And I feel like, oh my God, my legs are strong. I can run in water. Have you ever seen somebody run in water? You swim in water, you don't run in water. But when God anointed you and you have something to catch, you begin to run through water. Amen. It doesn't matter. Nothing stops you. We're going to capture something today. Amen. Now, last verse before we begin to pray. 1 Samuel still 30, 8 to 10. <clears throat> David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue this band? Shall I overtake them? And he said to him, Pursue, for you will surely overtake them, and you will surely what? Rescue all. Verse 9. So David went, he and the six hundred men who were with them and came to the brook Besor where those left behind remain. This one here there are 600 they are running they get to the brook Besor they were so exhausted that's what my version said they were so exhausted that they said, David, I'm done. I'm going to stop here at the Brook Besor. That's where the natural boundary is. In this, the natural boundary or the spiritual boundary. If you cross Besor, you enter the spirit. If you stay on this side, you are just on the borderline. But you are in the natural. We will not stay in the natural will not rest in the natural. Amen. will not relax in the natural. Amen. will not settle in our failures and we will not rest in our successes. Amen. We need to cross the brook. Amen. We need to go to the other side. Amen. 
Praise the Lord, somebody. Amen. Praise the Lord, somebody. Amen. Today, I want we be real with God before we enter in. I want you to search your heart and release every bitterness from your heart. I'm giving you now what we call prophetic instruction. When blessing is available and it comes with instruction, it depends on the instruction for you to possess the blessing. So give heed to the instruction. Unforgiveness and bitterness. If you're here, you know you're struggling with bitterness and unforgiveness. You're sour. It can be unforgiveness against God or against a human being or against yourself. We need to deal with that. We need to say, Father, take this away from me. Repent and name it. If you have it against a person, his name is David, so you say, this unforgiveness that I have against David. And don't cheat. Be real. Because there is a spoil that bear your name. But we have to do it right. Are you ready for that? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Let's bow our heads. Thank you, Father. As you repent before your God, He is faithful and just to forgive you and wash you from all unrighteousness. Whew. The Lord says, As you release those things, I have come to minister to you personally. This is the time you've been waiting for. I see the wind of the Lord blowing upon your life this time to refresh, to strengthen you. You are tired. Let him strengthen your feeble knees. Your mind is weary. Let him comfort you. of God. The strength of the Lord.
The Lord say I'm not silent. Heed to my small still voice. Feel my warm embrace. My daughter, my son, remove your eyes from the things that are worrisome. Remember my promises. Remember my saying. Remember my whispers in the secret place. I have not changed my mind. Let me take you to the place that is unknown to the wise of the world. Let me assure you in the place where I dwell, where I live. Let me give you my eyes to see as I see. Your burdens are my burdens. Release them to me. Release them to me. Release them to me. Step forth. Hidden in the waters, I will empower you to run. My hand is upon you, as it was upon the prophet Elijah. I will accelerate you. I will bring heavenly momentum to your life, to your affairs. Let me sponsor your movement. You have trusted for so long into man's ability. Today, here is my hand. Hold me. Hold the wings of the Spirit to fly in higher heights. I will show you the things to come. I will show you where to put the next step. I will show you the brightness of tomorrow. Do you feel like you've been dropped, abandoned, dropped and walk away from? This is the very place where you've been dropped, where you've been betrayed, abandoned, that you will find my life.
they were just going to bury a young man. But they drop him in the tomb of Elisha, running from their own life for their own lives. Sometimes it's better to be dropped than to be buried. Rejoice! Because there is life. There is life for you. I hear the Lord saying this afternoon, trust me, trust me, trust me, trust me, trust me. Don't change plan, trust me. Don't change plans to accommodate your resources in your hands. Trust me. Trust me. Don't shrink your vision. Don't shrink your dreams to accommodate what is in your hands. Look at what is in my hands. Trust me. Rest in me. As I speak to you right now, I feel like drops of what looks like dew. Snow melting dew. The Bible says the dew is the favor of the king. The Lord is pouring upon us a portion and a token of favor. Just let it fall upon you right now. Favor that will give you the upper hand. The favor that will distinguish you. The favor that will establish you. The favor. Favored one. Favored one. Favored one. Favored one. Thank you, Jesus. The Lord said, I will anoint you with fresh oil. And your cup will surely overflow. Let him remove that garment of heaviness. Let him clothe you of righteousness. Ashes to glory. Weak to strong. They don't need all to understand, but the Lord understands. A new zeal is rising within you. Weary, yet pursuing. There is a spoil that bears your name. There is a blessing that bears your name. There is a breakthrough that bears your name. There is a healing that bears your name. There is a turnaround to favor you that bears your name. There is a gift that bears your name. There is an open door that bears your name. There is a business. There is a job. 
that bears your name. There is an opportunity of elevation that bears your name. A chapter has closed. A chapter is opening. Many pages have been written. Many pages are waiting to be written. Jesus. Watch your mind clearing out. Let the heaviness wash them being lifted up from your mind, from your shoulders for a sure restoration of your laughter. like you to stand up on your feet now church in this atmosphere thank you for fresh oil father that our cup will overrun I declare this new season, our cup shall overrun. In this new season, our cup shall overrun. Follow ground being broken. I see this very clearly. Might be for few people here. Follow ground. The ground was so dry, it was not even absorbing the water anymore. Your labor will become to be easy, and the harvest will come quickly. Follow ground broken. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. God say for some people, it is a time of restitution, restoration. I will make you forget the past. And I open your eyes to see the bright tomorrow that is awaiting you. God said, I will convince you that what you thought you have lost that was so important, open your eyes. Greater things await. Even the opportunity that you thought you've lost, open your eyes. Greater opportunities await. I want you to hug God like this. Just hug. Squeeze Him. He's your Father. 
He loves you so much. He believes in you so much. Feel the rest in him that you may cease to strive. Your life belongs to him. He is the author, the finisher of your faith. He is the director, the writer, the maker of the film of your life. Rest in Him. Rest in Him. You say, I will cause you to rise up again. I will cause you to seek my face and you shall find me. O oh Lord, Cause me to run after you and I will chase after you. Relinquish it all into his hands. What matters it is this intimate touch and embrace from your father that's in heaven. Feel the pleasure of his heart it will give you peace. Feel the pressure and the satisfaction of his heart. It will give you rest. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for fresh oil, Father, upon us. Realign the desires of your people. Their priorities. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Don't leave. I really feel in my spirit we need to anoint on oil on our heads as a prophetic gesture for an overflow of the goodness of the Lord. I'm going to call the pastors and the prophets just to come stand here. Um, even if you release the children will be fine too, but if not, let's just begin already just to save time. The pastors just come. And the bishops. Thank you, Jesus. Put some of this in the hand of everybody. You know, I wish I can explain to you how I feel and what I feel. But it's hard to even say it. But one word is, this day shall be remembered. What you used to do with so much striving, it will not be difficult anymore. Things will begin to flow, if I can use that word, flow thing will begin to flow because God will give you a new perspective. I want we put oil upon the heads to obey what I have shared with you. Just on the head, fresh anointing, fresh oil. God anointed David, Mary Magdalene anointed Jesus with oil. It was for preparation for a greater assignment in the case of Christ confronting the last enemy that was death. In the case of David, it was to lead the great nation of Israel. The oil that will come upon your head will bring strength to you. That oil will bring a great establishment of authority in your life. You will begin to see things differently. 
you will begin to believe again. Thing that used to intimidate you will look so small. Thing that dread you will look so tiny. It will usher you in the realm of the knowing. King Saul was anointed and he began to prophesy. It changed his status. It moved him from a company of donkey keepers to the company of the prophets of God. This oil on your head will quiet the turmoil. Will quiet the instability of agitated thoughts and fears and anxiety and oppression will be broken because the anointing break the yoke it crushed the yoke beyond recovery this all will bring deliverance to you that you can walk home out of the overflow anoint your children go home today anoint your children anoint your dwelling your houses Declare this is a new day. God is changing my status. He's realigning the stars on my behalf. The line has fallen in pleasant places for me. What didn't work yesterday, I am looking forward to see an alignment. It shall work for me. The blessing of the Lord will come for me. My portion will bear my name. And no devil and no evil will take it away from me. It's my time, it's my season. The Lord has anointed me with fresh oil and my cup shall overflow. Blessing shall overflow. Abundance shall overflow. Thank you, Jesus. I will just ask you to come in line like this. Come in line before each one of the leaders. I want we put some music in the back and so you can go also and get ministered to. Put music in the back. Thank you, Jesus. Just move now by faith and begin to receive your portion. If a word came to your spirit, release that word. Father, thank you for the authority upon these men and women of God, pastors and leaders. Can we have some of other leaders to come and help because there's too many people. Jeff and the, the Kennedys and and everybody there is smarter. The ministers just come and join in. Take your portion and come and join in and, and, and touch them. And you go back home, get the oil, wherever the oil is. Give me the oil here. Thank you, Jesus. Right here, the oil is here. Here is Douglas. Douglas, get this, Heidi. Touch oil. Take your portion and begin to pray for people. This one here is the life changing. If we can put music in the background, please. Thank you. Malagendo robo sata kaya lante kete po se kete yabakata lando rakata mbaya mangele ayabash ah acceleration you shall not walk you will run not grow weary the anointing of the Lord will strengthen you to fulfill what God has set before you the anointing oil will open your eyes to begin to see clearly. It will strengthen your heart, strengthen your mind, strengthen your knees. The anointing will boost you. You are not going backward. You will be going forward in the name of Jesus. The anointing oil will break every yoke in your family, every yoke of poverty, every yoke of mental disarray. Be broken in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. 
Ayakaya Malagadagash. La Rade Bengerebo Sanda Kaya Balabaya Bagayash. La Kande Kete Matakaya Mantekele Basata. We declare a new, 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 fresh, new, fresh, new, new for cross point. Maya, Yadagaya, Ladagaya, Ladagaya, Branda Kato Kate Pele Pate Kataya Mama. That the weak will declare that I am strong. Maya Ndorosi and Dayaba. Your life shall not be the same again. Yanta Tekele Kete Barabosa. Yanta Kayama Tekele Kere Ababosa. Yatakaya matele ketayaba. The blind will say.